Okay, great. Uh, welcome everybody to this webinar on deep learning for text analysis with the BERT deep learning network. My name is Adrian. Oh, wait. Um, I'm a software engineer at NIME, located in Constance, as I already said. Uh, I'm working on many um, nodes related to machine learning and also deep learning. And I'm joined by Artem and Franziska. Maybe you guys quickly introduce yourselves as well. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Adrian. So my name is Artem Resik. I work uh, in Redfields. Uh, we are Elite's partner of NIME and we are located in Stockholm. So we are uh, experts in, in NIME, obviously, and also cloud services, uh, relational databases, crop databases. Uh, and also we do uh, NIME extension developments. Uh, so maybe you've been working with uh, some of them, such as OrientDB, Neo4j, uh, conformal prediction, anonymization. And today we are going to present one more. Hello, everybody. My name is Franziska Rau. I'm a working student at NIME and uh, I studied bioinformatics and now I'm doing my master's in data science. And yeah, in the end of this um, webinar, I'd like to show you my workflow as a use case. Okay, then there is one more organizational thing with this uh, webinar. You get a book code for our From Words to Wisdom, an introduction to text mining with NIME book. You can find it at the uh, URL posted here, but you should also find the URL in the chat and it will also be sent to you uh, with the follow-up email. So if you don't catch it now, don't worry, you will get your hands on it. Good, now for the agenda, uh, I will start with a quick journey through deep learning, text analysis with, and with the final destination of BERT. Then Artem will take over and show you how to do sentiment, sentiment analysis on movie reviews using BERT and the new aggregation uh, integration he has been hint hinting at. And the second use case will be presented by Francisca, which in which she will show you how to do semantic search on the Cord19 data set uh, using BERT. And Cord19 is a data set with papers on that relate to the COVID-19 disease, which you might have heard of. Okay, now, um, to start this journey, we will quickly look into what deep learning is. Uh, this is a meme that I think is actually quite nice for, for getting an idea of, of what deep learning to a large degree is, because it's really a, pi a huge pile of lin linear algebra that is tweaked until it provides you with the answers that, answers that you are looking for. So while that meme may not apply to all of machine learning for Deep learning, there is some, some truth to that. Uh, a figure that you probably saw before is this kind of typical neural network where you have an input layer where some vector of numbers is fed into the network, which is then processed by a hidden layer to produce hidden features and an output layer that combines that, then these hidden features into the prediction of the network. Those networks are also known as multi-layer perceptron or feed-forward neural network or sometimes a dense neural network as well. Now the question of course is what differentiates a neural network from deep learning? So the two words are really used um, uh, exchangeably nowadays, but usually you speak of deep learning if you have more than one hidden layer. And nowadays those networks tend to have hundreds if not thousands of layers. Uh, so they are really, really deep and um, that makes them very complex. But if you look at a single neuron inside of these, they tend to be quite simple in, in their structure. So you have those input, inputs x1 and x2 and the weights w1 and w2. And those are linearly combined and you apply some activation function to it, which is usually nonlinear, at least if you want your network to learn something useful. And this is then the output of this neuron that is fed on to the next layer, in this case, the output layer. And in this layer or in this output neuron, the same thing happens again, just with different weights and of course the different inputs. To make this a bit more concrete, here's an example. 
where we have the inputs four and two and the weights three and minus five. And then the activation function just uses the maximum of zero and whatever the linear combination of the weights and features is. So in this case, the linear combination would be two. So the output would be two as well because it's larger than zero. You might say, well, this is very simple, but um, in reality, things would be much more complicated, but that's not the case uh, because this is one of the most used activation functions nowadays. It's called the rectified linear unit and uh, it produces very nice, uh, many good results in uh, deep learning applications. Okay, so, um, and it has the nice property that it makes training those networks easier. Maybe let me quickly change to this pointer. This is nicer for you. Okay, um, and for training a network, you need one more ingredient, which is called a loss function. And the loss function tells you how good or bad your network is, is doing its job at predicting. So for, for a certain, or for, for an input example, where you know the desired output, the loss function tells you how far this uh, the network output is from the desired output. And depending on what kind of task you want to solve, you need a different loss function. If you do something like a regression where you have a numerical output value, there you would use mean squared error or mean absolute error. Um, or if you have a classification problem where you are interested in probabilities, you would use something like the cross entropy. And those loss functions are then used together with gradient descent to train the network. So what does gradient descent mean? Well, if we have an uh, input example, then we can plot the loss for different um, values of our weight. So in this case, we look at a single of those weights. So for example, W1 in our example before. And then for training, what would happen is we would actually start at a random initialization. So we would initialize it randomly. And where we would like to end up is of course here in this in this global minimum at the, low, at the value where we have the lowest loss overall. Um, and how is this done? Well, the nice thing of having a, a differentiable network and a loss function that, differ, that is differentiable is that we can use the back propagation algorithm to calculate the gradient. And the gradient tells us how much the network changes in like which direction. And it tells us how to decrease the loss function essentially. And then we just take steps in this direction until we reach a minimum. In this case, it's a local minimum. And that's a problem that you oftentimes have with deep learning that you end up in some local minimum that is not uh, perfect like the global one would be, but uh, it's uh, good enough essentially. And there are different kind of kinds of optimizers for neural networks, but they all usually use gradient descent under the hood. They just have some fancy techniques to improve um, convergence properties, for example. Now let's move on to text analysis. Text analysis is the part of data science that is concerned with analyzing text data. And text data has certain properties. It's represented as characters and words, not numbers. That will be a challenge later on. The order matters because if you permute uh, a text, then it loses, usually tends to use all of its meaning. The text can have variable length and we have lots of this data available usually, but it's usually unlabeled. So we can't directly use it for training. You would maybe have someone label it like this is a, a positive review, this is an additive review and so on and so forth. But just from the raw amount of data, there's lots of it available. You can just crawl the internet essentially or take Wikipedia or something like that. Some tasks related to text are sentiment analysis and semantic search. Those are tasks that we will see today, but there's also the ability to do language translation, question answering, part of speech tagging or something like named entity recognition. So, and I'm sure many of you actually have their own applications in, in mind right now. Now, how can we combine deep learning and text analysis? Well, the first challenge is uh, text consists of characters and words, not of numbers. And our network actually expects numbers as inputs. So a straightforward way to convert a text or a sentence into a vector is to do this kind of bag of words approach where we create a dictionary of words that are used in our data set. And for each of those words, we have one position in our vector. 
that corresponds to it. And if that word is present in the sentence, we set that uh, position to one, otherwise to zero. The problem here is, of course, that if we take these two examples, that's a good movie, not bad at all, and that's a bad movie, not good at all. Those two have the exact same bag of words representation, but their meaning is opposite to each other. So the network wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two because for, for the network, if you use this kind of bag of words approach, the two are identical. A different way we could go is with uh, word embeddings. So embeddings just mean essentially you have a, a vector representation, like a, um, a vector of numbers that represents a single word or maybe even a sentence. Um, and here we would represent each word by a vector and we would get this kind of sequence of vectors that represents our text, right? And here we have this one of the simplest encodings where we just use uh, a one-hot encoding. So if, if it's the word uh, at this position, then the vector would be one, otherwise it's zero and so on and so forth. Problem with that is, well, how can we use that with our feedforward neural network? And for that, we will simplify it a bit. Instead of having this here, we will simplify it to be represented by this kind of blob, which has an input and an output and produces an output. And then we could say, well, we apply this network to every word independently. Of course, that doesn't really help us if we want to do like a classification of a sentence because the words are not uh, the information of the, the words doesn't help us independently for that. So what we need is actually this kind of recurrent connection or state vector that is shared by the network. So what happens is instead of just producing an output vector, the network also produces a state vector that is then used as second input for the next word. And this carries on through the network. And once we read the end, reach the end of our text, the network has information on the whole text and could theoretically do a sentiment classification, for example. And that's what has been done for a very long, or well, not that long of a time, but um, many of those sentiment analysis approaches that are out there right now use recurrent neural networks or um, actually LSTM networks, which are a special kind of recurrent neural network. But they all have a, a problem in common, and that is that this state vector has to carry all of the information. And chances are, by the time you reach the end of your text or sentence, you kind of forgot what was in the beginning. And one solution to that is the uh, use of what is called attention. And in a nutshell, attention means that we produce this kind of state vectors for each um, word, but we actually can, uh, for each prediction, look at all the state vectors we had before. So it's not one vector that is altered all the time, but we create one vector for the first word that is then used to create the vector for the second word. And then both of them are combined to create the vector for the third word and so on and so forth. One step further from this is uh, self-attention where we simply look both ways. We don't only look backwards, but since we have the entire sentence available, at least in tasks like sentiment analysis, we can also just look at the entire sentence whenever we calculate a new embedding for uh, a single word. And how does this look in uh, detail? Well, there's actually three matrices involved with um, calculating uh, these attention embeddings, uh, a key matrix, a, a key matrix, a query matrix, and a value matrix. And those are just multiplied with the input. So I, I um, rotated them here for space reasons. So these are the, the inputs that we saw here. They are multiplied with those matrices to create three vectors, a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. And this is done for all of our inputs, right? And then for each of those inputs, we use, so in this case for x1, we use the, the its corresponding query, multiply that with the, or dot product that with the, um, with the key vectors, and then we get this kind of score that tells us that, okay, um, input two is uh, more important than input uh, three than input one for like uh, our output. Then we apply a softmax. So a softmax just takes 
this distribution and squashes it into a probability distribution so that they sum up to 100%. Uh, and then we use that to weight the value vectors, right? So this one would get the highest weight. So the second one would get the highest weight, the first one, the lowest weight, and we just sum them up and that would be the output of the self-attention layer. And this is then repeated for the other inputs as well. So the only difference here is that we use the uh, query for the second input. Now, self-attention is actually one of the key ingredients of the so-called transformer networks. That are, uh, these are networks that were developed for language translation. And um, what they use is this kind of multi-head attention approach, which essentially means instead of just having one set of those matrices, they have multiple sets to create the query key and uh, value vectors. Uh, which allows the network to focus on different parts of the input for um, at the same time. There's also some residual connections and normalization involved, but those are essentially uh, for the like training properties. Um, and then there is a feed forward network involved. And this is actually one of those, well, it, it's actually one hidden layer that is applied independently to each of the embeddings. And another key ingredient here is the use of positional encoding, because when we look at the entire input at the same time, we again lose this notion of order in the text. And positional encoding simply means that we add um, an indicator for the position of the, um, of the word in, in the text. And this is then repeated multiple times. So it's not just one of those blocks, but they take the entire block and apply that like six or 12 times. And then they have um, a good embedding for this kind of, uh, for the input sentence and the words inside of it. Now BERT actually stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. Um, but I'm pretty sure the word was chosen to result in a nice acronym, but that's quite common for deep learning papers, at least uh, in my experience. And BERT's architecture is pretty much the same as in the transformer. So this is essentially inside of BERT, you have multiple multiple blocks of this. Uh, but the special thing about BERT is how they format the input and how they train it. So for the input, they actually designed it to operate on pairs of sentences. And this is done by, first of all, they, they prepend a special token here in the beginning, and then they have a separator token that indicates that now the second uh, sentence starts. And this is very useful if you have tasks that involve multiple sentences like, um, I don't know, question answering, for example. Um, and this the use of the CLS token in the beginning is useful because you can use that as kind of a representation of the entire uh, entire input sequence. Not And then you have also the representation for all the words in the sentences and they are then output here as well. So the outputs of BERT are one um, vector for the entire sentence or input, and then one for each of the individual words in the sentence or sentences. As for the training, they used a large data set of consisting of more than 3 billion words for training and they used a special loss, which actually has two parts. So it's a multitask loss. This means that BERT learns to perform two tasks at the same time. And the idea here is to do pre-training. So we train on this large data set where we don't have uh, labels that are specialized to a certain task that we want to solve in the end, but we train it in an unsupervised way and then use the initialized network or pre-trained network to fine tune on the task that we actually want to solve. And how does this multitask loss look like? Well, the first part of it is a masked language modeling loss. And the idea here is to essentially randomly pick 15% of the words. And then for like 80% of those, they replace it with a mask token, which is a special token that masks out this word. And in 10% of the cases, they just pick a random word and insert that instead of the picked word. And in 10%, they leave that word as it is. And then they ask Bird to predict for those words they selected, the word that is supposed to be um, at this position. 
So essentially, this is like, you might know that from school where you have a sentence where certain gaps in that sentence and you, you have to fill them in. And that's what they ask BERT to learn to do. So as an example, we could have uh, our review saying that is a great movie. And then BERT would produce, uh, or the input would look like this. So we would that, then with the mask token A, and then we would pick merge instead of great and then movie. So this actually tells you what the rest of my schedule is for today. Um, and the second task is called next sentence prediction. So what they do is they, in 50% of the cases, the, the second sentence that is used as an input actually follows the first sentence. And in 50% of the cases, it doesn't. And they ask Bert to tell them, okay, does the second sentence follow the first one? And Bert actually gets pretty good at this. I think at the end of training, they reach like 97 or 98%. And this means that Bert has to learn to um, make like a semantic connection between two sentences. So as an example, we might have our input, that is a good movie, not bad at all, where the second one is actually following the first one versus that is a good movie, um, NIME is an open source analytics platform where there is no really re real relation between the two. Good, now how do we use BERT for an actual application like sentiment analysis? The idea here is that we take our review and add to it the special token in the beginning and feed that to BERT and BERT will output us um, all of those vectors and we discard all the vectors for the individual words because they, they are not what interests us here. We are actually interested in the representation for the entire sentence or the embedding for the entire sentence. And then we feed that to a small feed forward network. Sometimes you could even just use a single output layer and uh, have that predict the sentiment. You can't necessarily work, use that right away or only train this network, but what you would typically, typically do is you would train the two together on your data set. So you would actually change BERT um, a little bit to better fit, uh, to, to produce better representations for this task, but you, you, uh, you need a lot less training data compared to training it from scratch. And hopefully our network would then be able to give us an even stronger uh, classification where it would say like 99% positive, 1% negative. And how that is actually done with a NIME analytics platform is what Artem will show you next. So Artem, please take over. for your presentation and uh, introduction to the theory of deep learning and uh, BERT. So uh, this is the workflow uh, I'm going to present you today. Uh, and it's already available on uh, Nine Hub. So you can, you can uh, find it by these uh, keywords. Uh, and actually the um, BERT extension was released today. So th there might be some some issue with uh, th this workflow maybe today or tomorrow, but uh, for sure once, uh, so uh, all the system and the hub will be updated, you you, you can use this workflow. Okay, let's uh, take a look uh, on this workflow. So uh, obviously BERT is a very, uh, Cap cap is, a, is, is a tool with a, a big amount of capabilities. And we decided to uh, go step by step because uh, we are planning to extend this uh, uh, extension. So uh, we took the most um, famous and well-known popular problem is uh, text classification. Uh, so today we are going to uh, take a look on a most simple uh, case for uh, text classification, sentiment analysis. It's a binary classification. So it means that we have just two classes, positive and negative. And the data that we are going to work with is uh, movie reviews. So uh, this is the out, uh, input that I have. This is basically uh, just a bunch of uh, movie reviews taken from uh, the data set uh, from Kaggle, as far as I remember. And it has just two columns, the raw text and the sentiment column. So uh, we have only labels and the, uh, one input. Uh, 
so we don't do much pre-processing here. So uh, we just do some simple stuff like uh, getting rid of some uh, break raw tags and changing them to their spaces. And we also put everything in, into uh, all the text to lowercase. Uh, I will explain a little bit later why we are doing this. And that's it. So as you remember, Adrian explained that, you know, in order to use BERT or any other uh, neural network, you need to prepare the, the data. So basically you need to kind of translate or, or convert your texts into numbers, the numbers that the model, the computer understands. So uh, in our notes, we try to, uh, you know, uh, try to make it as simple as possible. So you don't have to make this, this stuff. Uh, all these operations, they are hidden behind the scenes in the nodes that we developed. Uh, so basically all the tokenization and uh, embedding uh, calculation is done by, by the nodes. Uh, then we just partition the input uh, data sets with partitioning nodes. Uh, so as long as we have 10,000 movie reviews, we split it 70 to 30% for training and tests. So 7,000 uh, reviews for training and the rest 3,000 for uh, test data set. So now uh, let's take a look on the node nodes. So uh, there are three nodes for now in this extension. And the first one is a BERT model selector. Uh, let's take a look on the settings. So this is how it looks like. Uh, these nodes uh, allows you to download and cache the model that is available on TensorFlow Hub. Uh, so right now, uh, TensorFlow Hub provides uh, eight models. Uh, most of them are dedicated to English lang language. However, there is a multi-language uh, model and a simplified Chinese language model. So we are going to take uh, a small model uh, for English for uncased. That's why I have uh, put all the texts to lowercase. Uh, another mode in this node is to use a remote URL so in case you have another model that might be applicable uh, for these nodes and you have a URL or you would like to, I, I don't know, maybe the TensorFlow hub will provide more models and we are not up to date with these models. You can provide the URL and download this model and then cache it somewhere in your on your computer. So basically you need to download the model just once after that, uh, it will be always read from cache. And finally, uh, you can provide a local URL in case you have trained your own model from scratch or somehow you have modified uh, your birds uh, with a custom scripts, uh, you can uh, fetch this model. So right now, uh, I would say um, these nodes have uh, some limitation to TensorFlow Hub models. Uh, because unfortunately there is no like a golden standard for models uh, because some models are built on top of PyTorch, some models are, are built on TensorFlow Hub, some mo models are built, uh, you know, some other ways uh, using different uh, frameworks or they are customized. So uh, we suggest you to stick to these models or at least the models that are based on the Google TensorFlow models. Okay, so once BERT model is uh, downloaded, uh, you can uh, propagate it to uh, BERT's uh, classification learner. So these pair of nodes uh, looks very similar to any other learner predictor nodes uh, that you might have seen in NINE, such as, let's say, random forest learner random forest predictor. So we, we were trying to, to follow the same logic as uh, NINE uses. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, learner node. Uh, it has three uh, input ports. The first one is basically the BERT model itself. Then goes uh, the data for training. And this uh, last optional port is used for uh, validation. So if you include some data for uh, validation during the uh, training process, it will be used. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, will, it will also work. So basically, it, it under the hood, it uses the same uh, Python classes that allows you to uh, inject some data for validation. And it, it's optional as well. Let's take a look on the settings of this node. Uh, on the first tab uh, called settings, uh, user is supposed to provide the most uh, basic, most important 
uh, settings. So basically just these two sentence column. This is the column with your texts. And as you can see, this is uh, just a stream. So you don't have to convert it to document type in NIME or in, you don't have to provide the tokenization yourself. So it's just a uh, raw text as it is. Uh, and the second uh, column that you need to provide here is the class column. So our data set has just two columns. Uh, it's just review and sentiment. So text is, is the feature for learning and the class column is sentiment. Uh, the next parameter, uh, max, uh, maximum sequence length, uh, refers to, uh, to BERT. And uh, the upper limit here is 512. Uh, the default value is 128, and I picked uh, that value, 256, because I, I just made some investigation regarding these reviews, and I found out that the average size of the review is something about 220 words. Uh, so I decided to, uh, to pick this value in order to, to, to fit most of, the, uh, most of the texts into, into BERT. Uh, yeah, so basically this is the length of, of the text that is going to be processed. So if it's shorter, uh, then it will be uh, padded. If it's longer, then it will be cut. Uh, the next tab called advanced uh, keeps these settings. So uh, these two most important is uh, are the number of epochs. So basically how many times your, your model will be uh, train so basically how many times the whole data set will go through feed forward and back forward operations and the batch size uh, the batch size is the number of records that are uh, used for one feed forward and um, and back propagation uh, steps uh, so obviously uh, it's better to train model more but uh, it's again it's a bit controversial question and uh, uh, there are ways how to uh, identify how many time how, how many epochs to to use, and batch size usually affects uh, the speed of learning process. But here you have to be careful because uh, you might be out of memory, uh, so you need to uh, define this parameter based based on your uh, hardware. So it's possible to use GPU uh, to to train uh, the model uh, and uh, usually GPU has uh, less memory uh, like uh, video RAM. Uh, well, however, it, it, it has more cores. So uh, the process on GPU uh, goes much faster. So there is a trade-off that uh, you have to decide personally depending on what kind of hardware do you use. Uh, and another checkbox is a uh, checkbox for fine-tuning BERT or not. Basically, it means that if you're going to fix the weights inside BERT or not. So activating this checkbox will increase uh, the training time significantly. However, it might lead to much, much better results. If you don't, if you deactivate this checkbox, uh, it means that uh, you will keep BERT as it is. You will not change the BERT weights. Uh, you will only change, uh, well, during the training process, only the uh, on top classification uh, network will be, will be learned. So basically we are using BERT as a monolith and uh, a special uh, small uh, classification neural network will be uh, tuned. So this is what Adrian explained on, on one of his slides. Uh, and the last options is just uh, optimizer. So you can uh, pick any, any kind of optimizer that is available uh, for TensorFlow 2, and uh, then you can pick some options. So this menu is uh, dynamic. So depending on what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of optimizer you're picking, uh, it will change the settings. So, uh, yeah, and the final node here is a predictor. So once you train your model, you just fit it in uh, and uh, and you also need to feed in the test data set. So the settings are pretty straightforward and it looks very similar to any other 
predictor node in nine. So you need to provide the sentence column, the column with the texts, set up the batch size. And if you wish, you can rename the, the output columns and you can add the uh, column with individual class probabilities. So here, as you can see, I have uh, uh, two sets of uh, learner and predictor node. And in two cases, I used fine tuning of BERT and I didn't use fine tuning for BERT. And finally, I prepared a dashboard that shows uh, uh, that shows the performance of the model. So on the left, uh, we have BERT's uh, model without fine-tuning, and on the right, with, uh, with fine-tuning. So as you can see, even by the shape of rock curves, uh, with fine-tuning, this rock curve is more convex, which says that most likely it leads to a better model. So there are uh, binary classification inspector nodes, uh, and it's possible to... Uh, to play around to move this slider to in order to see uh, what threshold should be set in order to, to, to take the best model for your needs. And uh, also there is an overview uh, for uh, confusion matrices uh, for both BERT with and without fine tuning. And here uh, we can take a look on these two parameters like overall accuracy and uh, coins kappa. As you can see, uh, with uh, BERT's uh, fine tuning, we get much, much better um, accuracy and uh, coins kappa. So uh, basically, uh, it gives us the best results. And uh, yeah, on the bottom slide, you can see the execution timetable. So uh, that's great that we have much better accuracy with BERT fine tuning. However, you can see that basically, if we activate this option uh, for BERT's fine-tuning, uh, the learning process uh, takes about three times uh, longer. So uh, on my computer, I used five epochs uh, and it took uh, half an hour uh, when I used fine-tuning and just 10 minutes without fine-tuning. Uh, so probably it makes sense to go without fine-tuning if, if just a cold start in order to maybe prove your hypothesis that this text is is uh, sufficient enough to to make this kind of classification or something like this so uh that was uh the, a quick demo of this bird extension and in future we are planning to uh extend uh uh, the number of nodes uh, for this bird uh, integration so maybe we will cover uh, different, uh, some other different uh, use cases such as question answering or abstract based sentiment analysis or NER, and maybe we will fix some, add some more capabilities to these nodes. Uh, and yeah, and this workflow is available on GitHub already. Thank you. Uh, Adrian? Yeah, I think Francisca will take over now, right? With our second use case. Yeah, that's right. Let me share my screen. Whoops. So hello again, everybody. Hope everyone is still awake. Um, now it's time to have a look at another example workflow. It is quite simple, but we can figure out some interesting insights. It is about semantic search using BERT. But first of all, what's semantic search? The word semantic refers to the meaning of a word, not the word itself. Applied to search, semantics relates to the study of words and their logic. Semantic search seeks to improve search accuracy by understanding a searcher's intent through contextual meaning. As a simple example query, we could ask, where can I find example workflows? And we would expect an answer like, example workflows can be found on the NIME hub. So let's come to the example workflow on how to use BERT for semantic search. For the example workflow, I used the COVID-19 research data set from a Kaggle challenge. It is freely available on the Kaggle website. The dataset contains about 200,000 articles and 
100,000 full articles, full text articles about COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 and related coronaviruses. The goal of this challenge is to use natural language processing algorithms and methods to get an insight on what was already published about COVID-19 and to support scientists in their research. Some tasks of this challenge are, for example, to answer scientific questions like, what do we know about COVID-19 risk factors? What do we know about vaccines and therapeutics? And what has been published about medical care? So let's ask Bert. But first of all, we need to know how it works. As a quick recap, we already know that embeddings are the vector representations of text where word or sentences with similar meaning or context have similar representations. With these embeddings, we can use a cosine similarity or distance to figure out how similar two vectors are. Calculating the cosine similarity is a technique that is being widely used for text similarity. It is a cosine of the angle between two vectors which gives us the angular distance between the vectors. In addition to the great Redfield nodes, we also provide a TensorFlow2 integration, which was released with NIME Analytics Platform 4.2. It is also compatible with our Keras integration, and it allows us to use models from TensorFlow Hub. In my example, I used a BERT model from TensorFlow Hub, which was already trained on the COVID-19 dataset. So let's come to the workflow. To simplify and speed things up, only the abstracts are read in. The pre-processing component converts the abstract columns to columns of type document, and some basic filters are used. For example, remove all non-English articles. In addition, all sentences are extracted, which are afterwards used as an input for the BERT model. To generate the BERT embeddings, a TensorFlow model needs to be created. The network creator node simply uses a pre-trained model from TensorFlow Hub. The TensorFlow 2 executor generates the embeddings afterwards. Now we can enter a search query and receive the most relevant papers for it. In the query component, the cosine similarity between sentences from the abstracts and the entered query is calculated. In the view, the top 10 results are displayed. So let's have a look at some example queries. The first query is about potential risk factors for COVID-19. As an example, we can see that a paper was found that says that obese people or people with diabetes have a higher risk for severe complications from COVID-19. Another example query is about vaccines and therapeutics to treat COVID-19. And one of the relevant papers contains information about the drugs that target RNA respiratory viruses. So as you can see, cool stuff can be done with BERT. You can find the workflow on NIME Hub. Feel free to play around with it. I hope you enjoyed this webinar today. And if you have questions, write them in the chat. And thank you all. Bye bye. Uh, I can maybe pick the one from. Ah, Artem, you would like to answer the past, uh, question of Ulf, right? So. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, so, yes, uh, basically, in order to run uh, our extension in Nine, uh, you should have a basic Python environment uh, set up uh, for Nine. So fortunately, uh, with the latest update for Nine four two two, they have this kind of a magic button uh, in um, in the settings for deep learning uh, for, for deep learning. So you can create the uh, deep learning uh, environment from scratch. Uh, just pick. Uh, the TensorFlow 2 environment, and it will create it. Uh, also, um, uh, in the workflow description, I have added uh, the list of packages that 
are necessary in order to run these nodes. So I would advise to uh, install these additional packages to this freshly new created uh, TensorFlow environment, and then you, you will be able to run uh, BERT. So it's a bit clunky, I have to admit, the, the way how uh, uh, how is going to be installed. So this is what we are going to improve as well. And also uh, you can run it on GPU. Uh, in order to, to do this, you need to have NVIDIA graphics cards. You need to install, I guess, the latest driver. So you can run it on Windows and Linux. Uh, and you need to install uh, CUDA and LibCUDA NN, uh, LibCUDA neural network uh, package as well. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Maybe one note, the TensorFlow 2 nodes are also based on um, Python, of course, and they actually allow you to write your own Python scripts if you want to train a network in, in NIME. Uh, we don't have a, a learner node for that yet. You saw the executor node. But for training, you can use the TensorFlow 2 API to write your own training script, which is actually much easier than it used to be in TensorFlow 1. And it's quite easy. Or, well, once you once you learn it, it's much easier to learn than the old API of TensorFlow. And it, it results in rather short training scripts. You can see the training script if you check out um, uh, the BERT workflow on Nine Hub. So we also have one version where we didn't use the nodes that Artem presented, but the TensorFlow 2 nodes. I will make sure that this is in the follow-up email for you to, to see. Okay, now um, there was one question to sum up the essence of BERT. So essentially what BERT does is it, it um, creates contextual embeddings of words and the entire and its entire input at the same time. That means you get a, a, a vector that represents a word as well as the entire sentence in the context of that sentence, which can be very useful as a um, input for a further uh, network that does some task on that, for example, classification as Artem showed you, but you could also do regression. And uh, there was also a question on ontologies. I'm not an expert on this. Um, so. I don't know an answer to that question, but I think uh, depending on what exactly you want to do, that should be possible. I mean, if, if you have some uh, text and want to extract an ontology, I'm not sure how you would design the loss function to do that. But if there is work that already does this with deep learning in some way, then it should be possible to, to use a BERT as kind of feature extractor for this task as well. Um, then there's one question that I think is for uh, Artem, like what hardware did you use to train the sentiment analysis workflow? Uh, yeah, there are several questions I marked uh, to answer. So uh, I'll, I'll start with another one. So Ulf is asking about, uh, again, about is learner using the Python script uh, underneath? Yes, it is. And the reason is that uh, basically, TensorFlow 2 that is used for running this code uh, doesn't doesn't yet have the backend based on Java. So basically, we are wrapping up Python code into Java in order to make a, a node in Nine. Uh, the next question is um, uh, yeah uh, regarding the hardware. So. Uh, it's always better to use uh, graphics cards, GPU, for uh, training the neural networks. So, of course, you can use CPU, but it might take much, much more time. Uh, however, if if you manage to, for example, uh, like take, take some cloud services to train your model, then you can uh, use this model for prediction using CPU because it's less... Um, uh, resource uh, con consuming. So that, that's the option. So in my case, uh, I used a laptop for training and I had a graphics card, NVIDIA uh, 2070 Max-Q. It has eight gigabytes of RAM. This is quite modern uh, graphics cards, uh, even for laptop, but actually on 
another computer that I used, I used uh, less powerful hardware. It was NVIDIA uh, GTX 960M with four gigabytes of RAM. So it obviously took much, like almost twice more time. So uh, yeah, uh, in order to, to, to train a model, uh, it's better to use graphics card. If you want to kind of train your own bird model, uh, it's going to be extremely long and uh, expensive. So probably you need to use some kind of uh, tensor processing units uh, that are available on Google Cloud, but they are really, really expensive and it's, it's a very tough task. And another question that uh, I saw uh, about the list of requirements for the packages, it's available in the description of, um, of the workflow. If you take a look on this workflow on Nine Hub, uh, there is a list so you can, uh, you can easily understand which packages uh, needs to be installed. Okay. Then uh, Abdullah had a question of uh, on testing the significance occurrence of certain words and documents. I'm not sure if I understand that correctly. So maybe uh, can you can you clarify that a bit? Because if you just want to detect certain words, then you don't need deep learning for that. You can just search for the word um, using either just a straightforward search approach, or you could do something like um, search like an elastic search that allows for some like typing or fuzzy search where you can have some some typos in your search but and it still finds it so there are um possibilities to do this kind of search uh which will be much easier than using a deep learning network to do that so but maybe i also misunderstand uh your question and then um based on the frequency in association with other words. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I... Th the question is always like, how would you define this, this kind of loss function for this task? If you can come up with a loss function that makes kind of sense, then you can usually uh, use deep learning for it. Um, another question was defining the weight of the literatures. I mean, Hmm. Okay, not sure like how you would decide whether literature is eligible or non-eligible with uh, research. Um, there are, however, like fact-checking um, uh, applications with using uh, BERT. I saw examples of that online where you would, uh, where BERT would, li would learn to answer certain questions or, or distinguish if, uh, if a fact was true or false. But that obviously needs to um, be fine-tuned a lot on, on your particular data set. Uh, there is a question from Philip uh, regarding the switching between CPU and GPU. Uh, so if you're asking about the our extension, uh, then there is no such switch. However, uh, in the uh, settings of uh, uh, deep learning in nine, uh, there is a checkbox to enforce CPU. So in case you have uh, an environment set for both GPU and CPU, uh, if you for some reason want to enforce CPU, you can activate this checkbox. Uh, another thing is that if you don't have GPU, or it's for some reasons is not recognized by the code or you didn't install some specific packages, by default, all operations will be done uh, on CPU. And it's applicable not only for this BERT extension, but I guess for any other uh, deep learning nodes in Nine for like Keras TensorFlow. Uh, is that right, Adrian? Yes, um, you can. So via the preference page, you can set up your, your environments to use for training and you can simply switch between environments. You could have one environment that is set up for GPU training or uh, GPU execution and one for CPU execution. And you actually have, can have different environments for Keras and for TensorFlow 2. So not sure if that answers the question. 
but there is some way like um, you can change the the environments and you can actually at least on those python nodes you can specify which environment to use as a flow variable but that's more uh advanced at least right now but that's something we are also looking to improve in the future um then there was a question by sergey uh, can BERT be run as an unsupervised flow without train set indicating uh, the variable for positive or negative so hmm not necessarily. Um, I don't know if there has been work like that, but I know that for a very large LSTM network, the company OpenAI once found out that one um, dimension in, in the embedding vector that they got from this network actually in indicated sentiment very well. The problem is you still need to figure out which dimension might have uh, a certain, uh, might encode a certain meaning like sentiment for example. So in general, it's easier to, so you need kind of a training set to figure out these correlations. And then the question is whether you can't use it, use it to actually find your, your network as well. So the answer is, might be that there's already uh, a notion of sentiment encoded in, uh, in the embeddings that BERT produces, but you have to, f to kind of find out how exactly that would be encoded and then oftentimes it would be easier to actually use a training set to train um, the network or fine tune the network. Then there was the question whether you can create a bot using NIME. Actually, there is um, a summit presentation on how to create a teacher bot in NIME. It was kind of like a, a question answering bot that didn't use deep learning at all. That was an uh, application we did a couple of years ago as a nice uh, example, but you can actually, I think, use BERT for that. So you would use it to encode the, um, to encode the question. So extract essentially the essence of the question and then train a model that produces an answer from that. That model could be, for example, based on an LSTM, but there are also those um, uh, transformer-based networks for language trans, uh, uh, generation that could learn to generate text like that. We also have example workflows on how to do text generation using LSTMs. I believe we did that for mountain names or something like that. And if you combine that with, with BERT, that could be one viable path to creating such a bot. Uh, there is Martin, maybe you want to answer the the question multi-label classification yeah exactly uh maybe i wasn't clear during my presentation but actually it already has multi-label classification so just to make it clear i picked uh sentiment analysis as the most simple case it's a binary classification but for example if you would wish to classify different types of articles like i don't know uh, lawyer documents uh, or medical documents or financial documents uh, and you can tra train the classifier that classifies the types of the documents so it's already on place uh, so there is one more question from Tiago uh, regarding uh, different transformers uh, so uh, unfortunately no not right now. This is what we are looking for, for but uh, as long as uh, Excelnet and PyTorch, they are kind of completely different from TensorFlow 2. Right now, uh, you cannot use these models with, uh, with this BERT extension nodes, but most likely you can use it with uh, like Python snippets node uh, inside Nine. So uh, this is what we are looking forward to and uh, I hope well, someday we will, we will uh, make the, the list of models that are compatible with our nodes much broader. But right now, no, you, you cannot use any other, uh, at least you can try and it would be really nice to, to get this feedback. Uh, but I think Adrian, can you clarify if you have any experience working with PyTorch uh, with Python snippets in Nine? Uh, no, unfortunately not with PyTorch, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if those networks are necessarily 
trained using PyTorch. I mean, if you have them as TensorFlow models, as TensorFlow saved models, actually, then um, you can easily load them into the TensorFlow 2 integration and use them with those nodes. So you won't be able to use the nodes that uh, Artem showed today, at least not yet. But if it's if they are TensorFlow models, then uh, you should be able to use them with the um, TensorFlow 2 integration. So you can use, for example, the executor. Uh, and PyTorch is something that is very interesting for us, but we just haven't gotten around to integrating it at this point. And it's also not clear when we will be able to do that uh, going forward. There was one question about how BERT deals with ne uh, negation in sentences. Um, that's an interesting question, but the idea of um, attention is actually that hopefully BERT would pick up on, on this kind of negation, because negation is an interesting problem in, um, in, in uh, text-related tasks, right? And LSTMs already... So recurrent neural networks already did a pretty good job on this kind of um, problem. So it would pick up if there was, for example, a not. So not good would would be like equivalent to bad. And BERT is probably able to do that as well because it can see, ah, okay, there is a um, a not coming before, like in front of uh, of good, if we have uh, this, this sequence of not good. And here the important thing is, of course, it has to know whether not as before or after the, like where in the input those words are located. And that's where this positional encoding um, that I mentioned for transformers comes into play because it gives the network an idea of where in the input a word is actually located. And this way, hopefully it can pick up on things like negation. Okay, Paolo has a question. Maybe this will be the last question we answer. We are already like um, four past six. Um, how can you incorporate a model that you trained in a workflow um, programmatically? Well, one thing you could do is, um, if you want to use it from Python, you could train the model in NIME, if you use TensorFlow 2 at least, and then write it to disk as a TensorFlow 2 model and read it from Python. That's one way you could go. If you have um, a NIME server, you could actually have your uh, model running on a server and uh, have a REST. So on the server, you have a REST API to call workflows that are located on the server. And you would send the data that you want to predict to the server and would get the answer um, or the prediction of the model from the server as an, uh, in a REST call. But just um, embedding a... Nine workflow as uh, like an, a callable in in Java is not nothing that is supported at the moment. Not sure. Well, maybe that, somebody did something like that before. Uh, I have an idea here. Uh, actually, Nine uh, can be run in a batch mode. So probably, if you're using any other language as Java, as you said, uh, maybe you can make a like a bash command in order to run this workflow. So this work will probably then need to save its results somehow. It could be, I don't know, maybe an Excel sheet or JSON file or whatever. And then you can fetch it back from your code. This is another option. Maybe it's not really efficient and optimal, but you can try it out. Okay, then um, thank you again for listening in today. We will... Uh, <laughs> look at the questions and uh, see that we come up with an answer to them um, and follow up with you guys. And well, thank you very much again and have a nice evening. Goodbye. Goodbye.